it relates to African Americans, has really never been authentically told in a way that promotes not only uh, healing, but restitution and reparation. Mm -hmm. And so what we have to do in America is finally have a come to Jesus moment. Yeah. Have a day of reckoning where the truth be told. And I think what, what has happened in Tulsa, though, really sets us on the right course. Because, in fact, now I truly believe that we're going to pass H.R. 40 because this is a moment of reckoning. Yeah. This is the truth being told, and this is going to help us move forward and get H.R. 40 uh, passed. So uh, the truth shall set you free. Yeah. I, I love that you that you reference H.R. 40, Congresswoman. Of course, our lead sponsor of the bill is uh, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, who's sitting right here. The, my, the favorite um, or my favorite moment of you introducing this bill was knowing that you were carrying on this legacy from um, now past Congressman Conyers, who introduced H.R. 40 every Congress since 1989. What led you, Congresswoman, to really keep this fight going and having the faith after all this time that Congress would really consider it, not just hold hearings, but consider it, pass it out of committee? What's giving you the hope that it'll make it past the House floor and maybe to the Senate? Reparations time is now. Yes. And um, to my dear uh, beloved friend uh, who did carry it, but what most people don't know is that 1988 was when a Republican president signed reparations, the Civil Liberties Act for Japanese Americans. And African Americans were stand-up people. They were right there supporting, right there agreeing. And then this bill was written in 1989. And I do want to thank the Japanese American community. They are front and center with us, yeah. as are the rabbinical, the Episcopalians, and just an array of organizations, of course, from Human Rights to Urban League to NAACP. But as he was retiring, I was very honored to be able to be given this honor. Uh, and it, it was, I think, a duty. Uh, it was an obligation. Uh, it was payback. And so those early years were pretty dark years. Yeah. Um, because for some reason, Americans have a hard time saying that word when it's us. And so we decided to take a different approach as we grew. Um, one, my sister, our names are similar, and we became uh, in partnership with the idea of truth and reconciliation, but with the idea that H.R. 40 moves to create that pathway. Uh, we were in a church yesterday, and the Reverend Doctor, I have to call his name, Dr. Faison, said, there is no reconciliation without justice. So yeah. H.R. 40 represents that. But in any event, we begin to look at human rights. We begin to look at being more bold about saying, uh, rather than, you know, ask the question that we have always been asked, why? We say, why not? Yeah. We try to get over this hump of, I didn't have slaves. I didn't uh, brutalize anyone. Um, I don't have any money to pay. I didn't do anything. And so we begin to, to, to focus in, Angela, and thank you for your leadership. You, you got us where we are today, right in this room. But I begin to say government-sanctioned action, yeah. which is what is here in Tulsa. Mm -hmm. Government-sanctioned slavery. Government-sanctioned the black codes. Government-sanctioned Jim Crow. Government-sanctioned the lynching. Government-sanctioned the whole 20th century of segregated America government sanctioned redlining government told states oh you handle the gi bill so when the people came when the soldiers came back if i was in mississippi i'm just using an example or in texas i didn't get the gi bill maybe somebody else in another state might have but i didn't get it because i was black my grandmother didn't get social security because she was a domestic and they wrote in the bill that domestics were not eligible because that means those employers would have to pay and so this began to grind and grind and i said why why are we embarrassed why do we have a paper bag over our head? Mm -hmm. It is just for there to be compensation, but there to be relief. And so we began to coin the phrase, take from the Martin's book and say why we can't wait. Mm -hmm. Now we've got another phrase saying we've done our part. We paid our taxes. We've died. We've gone to war. Um, and then tragically, we become the fodder for the mass incarceration and the fodder for black men on the streets with police misconduct. Yeah. 
And so that's where I came to say that this is a moment in history. This year, this year we must pass H.R. 40. Now, that is in tandem with justice here in Tulsa. And we just feel that we have been catapulted right into the national fabric to say that there is no moving forward without justice for Tulsa reparations and to pass H.R. 40, which is legislation, which is a bill, which is a commission. And we have obviously um, uh, modified. So it is more than what John said, and he welcomes that. It is to develop reparation proposals yeah. reported back to the United States Congress to act on. And I know leaders like Angela Rye will not let us sit on a reparations bill that we should be acting on, and we thank you all for that. And that's we just think that we have just been overwhelmed by the wonderment of where we've been over these last couple of days that we really do have to act and act on H.R. 40. Thank you, Congresswoman Jackson Lee. Um, it has been um, such so so encouraging to watch you work around this. I think Ms. Lawrence said it best. We're like, we're planting trees, and Congresswoman Jackson Lee is like, reparations, though. So thank you for that as well. Um, Congresswoman Blunt Rochester, I want to turn to you because we were just sharing space yesterday, and you said something so profound about filling the spirit of the ancestors even during the January 6th insurrection. Fill in the spirit of the ancestors in a positive way to let you know that you're resilient and powerful. But there's another kind of thing that's hovering around this reparations discussion, and that is the questioning of our humanity, right? The reason that we're not worthy, Congresswoman Jackson Lee just hinted at that. And I think it's really the, the reason that people felt like they could go back to Capitol Hill, tear it up, and take their power back. What are some of the things that the Congressional Black Caucus, state and, elected, uh, state and local elected officials here, need to be working on to deconstruct that mentality so when we fully embrace the Black Wall Street mentality, we have the ability to really implement what was destroyed? Thank you, Angela, so much for that question, and thank you for your leadership. I mean, first of all, I want to acknowledge that this moment is a, a, a moment of urgency. Yeah. And that it is the collective that's going to make the difference. And so what's really pushing this across the country, even being in this room, seeing people from Dallas, Texas, seeing people from all over the diaspora coming together at all ages, from over 100 years old to the young people. A young boy named Preston came to me this morning, and he, he said, I'm afraid to ask this question. But he said, in my school... I heard they just passed a law that they can't teach us right. about Tulsa. That's right. And so what I committed to that young man was that when we go back, in addition to talking about reparations, we're talking about education. I'm on the Energy and Commerce Committee in Congress. We focus on health care. We focus on commerce and trade. It's got to be all hands on deck. Every single person can play their part. Mm -hmm. And that's all we're called to do. And so being here for me, having been up in that gallery during the insurrection, I could feel the spirit of our ancestors. I could feel all of them, from Jim Crow to slavery to, to Tulsa, saying for us to do our part right now. So if you're a legislator, legislate, appropriate, get the monies directed. If you've never run for office, I never ran for anything in my life until I ran for Congress. Yeah. Never ran for anything. We got to stand up for ourselves. We got to run for office. We got to help and support each other. And we got to support our legal teams as well. So I'm just glad to be a part of Tulsa. Um, the one line that came out, keep the light on. Yeah. Keep the light on. We cannot let this day go by. And we've committed that we're going to pass H.R. 40. Yeah. We're going to pass H.R. 40 this year, this year, this year. Thank you so much to Congresswoman Jackson Lee, Congresswoman Lee, and Congresswoman Blunt Rochester. I know Congressman Johnson had to step out, but as the, um, co the primary sponsor of the Tulsa Claims Act, um, I also want to just acknowledge that also was the work of Congressman John Conyers. And again, to see you all carrying that on and making it stronger, that's what this is all about. So as you all begin to wrap up, uh, because it's time, it's 3.58, and I would love for you all to come back 
from the red carpet and from your table conversations as you all are developing your calls to action. Let's give the Congresswoman another round of applause. Thank you. We're not quite at the benediction, but we're close. It's almost my benediction because I have to go try to catch a flight. And my brother left me up here. Demario, come back. Well, can I just shout out to the people from Texas? I know you're in the room. Paul Davis, I know AME members. I know they're all around. Thank you so very much. Thank you all so much. I'm so grateful. I love y'all. Mm -hmm. And can we give a shout out to Angela Rye? It's Angela Rye who's keeping the light on. Just one moment. Racial injustice is a scourge on this nation, and the black community has felt it for generations. We have an obligation to do something about it. Whether it's canceling student debt, increasing the minimum wage, or investing in black-owned businesses, the black community deserves so much better. I'm Nina Turner, and I'm running for Congress to do something about it.